In this day and age, most people aren't really surprised by politics. I think the general population has really grown accustomed to the idea that politicians are inept, that they're going to make uh, mistakes, they're going to screw up, they're going to say the wrong thing, they're going to embarrass themselves, their party, their family, and for the most part, the general population will point and laugh, but outside of that, they're fairly apathetic to it. And that's on a national level. If you get down to the local level, you're, you're dealing with a very large blind spot when it comes to the everyday citizen. Politicians at a local level aren't really paid attention to very closely. And so for the majority, if it's not some spectacular screw-up, it's ignored. You might get a write-up in an article, maybe a news station will cover it, but after a day or two, it just sort of disappears. It fades into the background. But every once in a while, an event takes place that's so far beyond the pale of what is acceptable, of what should be allowed for a public official, that it needs to be talked about and brought to the attention of the public so they can really observe what their duly elected officials are actually doing with the power they've been given. And and such an event happened last night on Wednesday, December 23rd. Now, the politician in question, Alondro Kano, is a Minneapolis councilwoman. She's a representative of the 9th Ward. She is DFL endorsed. And what she did, it's almost beyond words. I've never really seen a politician do something this blatant, and I've never seen them be so unapologetic about it. Now, what you need to know going forward is, this behavior isn't just confined to this one politician. In fact, it's a common theme played out again and again and again when it comes to the DFL, the Democratic Farmer Laborer Party in Minnesota. And we're going to be talking about these different incidents, but I want to focus on this one to start. Now, more than likely you're familiar that yesterday there was a protest scheduled at the Mall of America. The Mall of America is a nationally recognized gigantic mall. It's located in Minnesota, and the protesters had chosen it for their place to draw attention to their cause. Now, their cause is a multifaceted thing. But this was Black Lives Matters. This is the group that's been showing up on college campuses all over the country, and more recently in Minnesota for the Justice for Jamar protests outside the 4th District Police Station. Now, Jamar Clark was somebody who was shot by a police officer, and some of the witnesses had claimed that he was handcuffed, put face down on the ground, and executed by police officers. The official story is quite a bit different. The police and the local authorities say that Jamar had beaten a woman, that EMTs had arrived on scene to render aid to her, that he attacked the EMTs to stop them from being able to render aid. The police officers showed up on scene, tried to get him to stop his attack on the EMTs and let them take care of her, and that he'd gone for a gun, and the officer shot in defense. Now, that one event caused a protest that has lasted for months. It was only recently ended when the local government came in and bulldozed the encampment, and they had an encampment surrounding the police station. Up until then, there had been multiple reports of violence, there had been vandalism, people were throwing bricks and breaking bottles on the highway, they were blocking off traffic, they were putting up graffiti, they were getting violent with anybody who was coming into the area, and we'll look at clips of that. But it was a very large gathering that had sustained itself for, for quite a while. So this was one of the things that was involved in the Mall of America shutdown. Now, as people came to find out, it wasn't just the Mall of America. They actually targeted the airport as well, trying to shut down people's abilities to take trips over the holiday weekend. So this massive protest goes on. And who do you think is in the middle of it? Who do you think is involved in this protest? That's right, your Minneapolis duly elected city councilwoman. She's taking part in the protest. In fact, if you look at her social media accounts, you will find out that she's been actively involved, actively involved with Black Lives Matters and with Justice for Jamar. She is unapologetic and she's very outspoken about it. She talks about it on Twitter. She talks about it on Facebook. It is something she is deeply invested in. So after having attended this event and the local press covering it, she received emails from constituents, from people in her district and all over Minnesota who said they disagree with a city councilwoman going going to these protests. Now, how do you think she reacted? What do you think the reasonable reaction of a politician in this situation would be? To perhaps email them back and have a discussion about it, or to just simply ignore it? Well, that's not what she did. Instead, what she did was take their private information, including their full name, phone numbers, emails, and home addresses, and post it on Twitter inside the hashtag used by these activists. By these activists who are known to be violent, by these activists who have caused property damage, who have shut down highways, who have shut down malls, and who have shut down airports. She did this repeatedly for hours on end, doxing people over and over and over again. Now, her initial response to the criticism was, this is legal. In fact, this is what we're supposed to do. She would have the Minnesota public believe that when political officials have correspondences with everyday citizens, that they release that information in a hashtag on Twitter. But that's not the case. That's not the proper protocol that's followed. If I were an elected official, I can't choose a hashtag to throw your private information in and then use my account to put it out there. However, the majority of people who are watching this take place didn't really believe that because they're not complete idiots. So what do you think her follow-up response was? 
Was she reasonable in removing the information? Of course not. Not surprised that I'm being targeted for supporting today's Black Lives Matters event. Data practices requests are helpful in exposing racism. So what is the implication of this tweet? What is she saying as a elected official? That the information she released on people, on her constituents, was in regards to racism? Is she claiming that the people who criticized her involvement in this, uh, this group, this activist group, were racist? Or is she criticizing the people that were responding to her releasing that information? Either way, it's a, a heavy claim from an elected official. It borders on libel. She's making a public written statement saying that anybody who disagrees with her and the people that she released information on are racist, with nothing to back it up. She is smearing their name publicly, in an official capacity, as she releases information related to her job. But of course, it's not just racists that are out to get her. No, it's misogynist too. This is a, another tweet she released after receiving more criticism. Many of us women of color are being targeted for standing up and speaking out. We need to support one another. So it's not just that the people who are criticizing her are horrible racist people that don't like black people. No, it's that they're misogynists and they hate women as well. Now, if you fast forward a few hours, interestingly enough, all those tweets mysteriously vanished. I I'm not sure why that is. Maybe it has to do with the national media coverage. Or maybe somebody at the DFL told her how badly she was going to get sued for doing something this preposterous, something this abhorrently wrong. But then again, who am I to criticize her? She's the politician here. Kano obviously knows what her job entails. That's why she goes on expensive, taxpayer-funded vacations to Europe. You know, the ones that cost thousands and thousands of dollars and bear no legislative fruit? Because that's what being a politician in Minnesota is about. That's what being a part of the DFL is about. And, of course, she loves using the station of her office and the accounts which are associated with it to help you check your privilege. Because we wouldn't want any white heteronormative males getting away without knowing that they're shitlords and that they should feel badly about it. Of course, if you dare to criticize her, prepare to be blocked. Now, that's sort of funny, isn't it? That she can claim that she's using Twitter in an official capacity related to her job to release information to the public, which she is compelled to do, yet she blocks the public from viewing that very information. It's almost like she wants to have her cake and eat it too. But again, I'm just a stupid taxpayer. I don't know what I'm talking about. Clearly, when you become a politician, when you become part of the city council of Minneapolis, you can release people's private information to activists that have done violent things in the past. And who cares if anybody has a problem with it? You can just block them. And if it gets real bad, here I come, Europe. But hey now, it's not like there's a problem if a politician wants to be a part of an activist group. So what if Kano associates with Black Lives Matters and justice for Jamar? I mean, Jamar Clark was a good boy. He didn't do nothing. He was, he was innocent. He was gunned down viciously by racist police officers. I heard he used to run a charity. He would go door to door in a Boy Scout outfit and collect money for the needy. It's, it's terrible when you see these racially motivated crimes by police officers in the state of Minnesota. Oh, what, what's that? Oh, Jamar Clark has a prior record. What? Oh, he was arrested for running from the police and led them on a high-speed chase that only ended when he crashed his car going 70 miles an hour? Well, I heard during that particular incident that the police officers tried to assault him. It was another racially... Oh, wait, what? Oh, there was video footage of that one that showed he was full of shit, that they never did what he said they did, that he made it all up. Well, okay, so maybe Jamar Clark is just a bad example. I mean, the people that are down at Black Lives Matters, the people that are associated with Justice for Jamar, they're, they're kind-hearted. They're out there for the right reasons. In fact, let's hear what those right reasons are. Here's Jamar Clark's brother at the protest outside of the 4th Precinct police station. Let's hear his opinion on why they're down there. Paris ended up getting attacked. And I said it was justified. They should have left him alone. But since it ain't justified, and then they went out to... <clears throat> they went after my man's because he was behind the attack. And instead of going into the building to make sure that it's confirmed that he was in there, they shot up a building with over 15,000 rounds to complete the mission and goes in there and grab a fingerprint and say it's him. It's impossible. You can't do that. America worked funny ways. As long as you have a badge, as long as you're behind the government, you can get away with anything. You know, I've been saying fuck Obama, but y'all have turned Obama here gray. So you know what, Obama, you need to tell them, fuck y'all. <laughs> Leave ISIS alone. Let them motherfuckers do what they end up doing. I'm with ISIS all the fucking way from here on out. 
shit, let them kill any motherfucker by they want to end up killing because you know what? They're doing it for a reason. And they're doing it for a stand. Just like we're doing this shit for a stand. It's for a reason. All this shit's for a reason. I'm sorry. Did he say ISIS? I think I, I must have misheard him. He must have said, God, it's really icy out here. He must have been talking about the, the weather because Winter Chan is coming and bringing her snowy embrace to the state. He couldn't, he couldn't seriously have... When I'm with ISIS all the fucking way. From here on out. <laughs> Shit, let them kill any motherfucker by they want to end up killing them. Oh God, he did. He did really say that. And this was directly after the Paris attacks where a hundred plus people were murdered in cold blood and hundreds of others were injured? All right, so I'll admit, maybe associating with movements that back career criminals and have members directly related to it that support ISIS and terrorism, maybe, maybe that's a bad look. But it's not like people in the DFL itself ever said they support ISIS. That would be fucking crazy. Oh, wait. Dan, Dan Kimmel said that? The same Dan Kimmel that was at a DFL fundraiser when he tweeted out, ISIS isn't necessarily evil. It is made up of people doing what they think is best for their community. Violence is not the answer, though. Well, at least he's a pacifist about it. You may, you may remember this little incident. It happened, uh, you know, a little while ago, but it, it made some news. You know, a few, a few, oh wait, the whole international community picked up on it because it's, it's insane. Why would you ever say this? Now, the DFL, they freaked out, and they, they probably kindly told him behind the scenes, um, hey, don't say that publicly. That's a bad idea, Dan. And maybe you want to withdraw from the race because you're never going to get elected. This is the, uh, this is the perfect example of how to kill your campaign with one tweet, by the way. If you're a poli-sci major and you want to see what not to do when it comes to politics, Dan Kimmel is fucking example number one. Take a good look. This is, this is career suicide. And he committed this seppuku live on Twitter for the whole world to watch. Okay, so I'll admit, it's a little bit strange, a, a tad bit unusual to see a DFL politician openly endorse ISIS. They say, hey guys, they're just uh, actively engaged in the community. They're giving back. They're, they're activists. It's a, a little weird, a little weird to be honest. And it's a tad bit awkward as well to see Alejandro Cato, a Minneapolis city councilwoman involved in a movement, Black Lives Matters and Justice for Jamar, that has people associated with it who also openly endorse and sympathize with ISIS. But that's only two people. It's not like there are more DFL party members that are engaged with these groups, that are taking part in these things, unless you count uh, U.S. Representative of the 5th District of Minnesota, Keith Ellison. He's been a part of Black Lives Matter since last year, and his son has been involved in the Justice for Jamar 4th Precinct protest. Anybody else noticing a common theme with the DFL? What is with sending their kids out to protest sites? Both Kano and Ellison have sent their children out to take part in these activities. Now, I find that strange because if you read Alejandro Facebook, she talks about how evil white supremacists showed up and gunned down innocent people. In fact, that was in the news for a while. There was a shooting at the Justice for Jamar 4th Precinct protest. Now, if you read the news and you listened to politicians, namely politicians in the DFL, you were told that these were horrible racists who showed up just to shoot innocent people that were uh, exercising their First Amendment rights. That's what you were told. But if you happen to watch the live streams or listen to witness accounts, it's a completely different story. I'll let the uh, protesters for Justice from Jamar explain to you what happened from their perspective. All right, so this is what happened, though. So, All right, so they came, if three people came up, one of them had a recorder in their hand. They instantly, when they came on the block, they was recording everything like this, like they were trying to get people's faces. So I was sitting down on the fire, my brother called my name, and he told me to come here or whatever. And then everybody started rushing them at the same time. Tell they them to take like, off their mask. They were saying, take mask. off your mask. Why you got your like, mask on? They was like, we ain't got to take off. Fuck no, fuck, fuck no, no, fuck no, fuck no. They just kept having the camera in everybody's everybody face. face saying, like, fuck no, yeah, just fuck moving no. moving it around or whatnot. So we go back, we instantly, we go over here and shit, we trying to get them to move around. And uh, it's people, like, we debating whether they white supremacists or not because one of them got a Black yeah, Lives Matter sign. But they, they all yeah, had their face masks They all had they face masks and, and the cover. We tell, so we tell them all you got to do is, the, the, the one that had the uh, Black Lives Matter, I said, all y'all got to do is take off your mask. And he, no, no. So no. somebody out the crowd punch one of them, they hit the gate over here. After that, one of them started reaching and backing up. I'm like, he got a gun, he got a gun. They so stopped. after they hit the gate again, they hit this way. They went around the corner, somebody hit somebody else and they hit the gate one more time. And after that, they started running back and then the crowd started chasing them down there. I'm telling, they them, got down I'm there, telling them like, they, they got a gun, don't follow them, don't, don't chase them down right, there. They, 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 they going, they got a gun, they reaching, they reaching, they reaching, they reaching, they reaching for the gun or whatever. So they hitting the block, they running down the block and we, we, we turn around. I tell him like, no, we, come on, we turn around. 
around. So he telling me to turn around. So I go back, and then we telling the crowds to come back. Like, come back, don't go down there. They got a gun. They got as a soon gun. As they, they continue to run after them. And then as soon as they got them down there, they tried to get them to a spot where there weren't no cameras at, and they start opening fire. And they let off about eight rounds, and they eight shot rounds. five people. So according to the people that were actually protesting there, four people showed up. They were a little too white for their liking. People demanded they show ID, demanded they take their masks off, demanded they identify why they were there. When the four people didn't comply, they were assaulted. They were punched and pushed against a fence by a group of people. These four men then try to leave and are chased by this group, eventually leading to one of them pulling out their firearm and defending themselves. That sounds a lot different from what Kano is talking about on Facebook and what other DFL politicians have been saying on social media. It almost sounds like they had a lynch mob chasing them and fired in self-defense. Okay, so you've got a Minneapolis City Councilwoman and you've got a U.S. Representative and you've got somebody who was running for office, all associated with the DFL, all associated with movements that have made supporting or sympathizing statements in regards to ISIS and have violently behaved in the past, you saw the video clips. I, I didn't make this up. I didn't pull it out of thin air. These are their words, not mine. But it's not like more people are involved. It's not like Keith Ellison and Mark Dayton are talking to one another about how to approach the Black Lives Matters protest and the Justice for Jamar protest. Oh, wait, they are talking. That's the same Mark Dayton that went up to St. Cloud, Minnesota, and told the people living there, if they didn't like the immigration policy of Minnesota, to get the fuck out of the state. Look around you. This is Minnesota, Dayton said. Minnesota is not like it was 30, 50 years ago. But this is Minnesota, and you have every right to be here. And anybody who cannot accept your right to, to be here, and this is Minnesota, should find another state. If you are that intolerant, if you are that much of a racist or a bigot, then find another state. Find a state where the minority population is 1% or whatever. It's not that in Minnesota. It's not going to be that again. It's not going to be that in St. Cloud or Rochester or Worthington. But he wasn't finished there either. He had a, he had a, a few more choice words for people who were concerned about immigration in Minnesota, and why wouldn't they be concerned about it? We recently, and this, this happened just in the last year or so, had six people from Minnesota who wanted to go across seas and join ISIS. They were actually going to use tax money to do that, by the way. Student loans, that's, that's how they were going to finance their trip to go overseas and join a terrorist organization. But Dayton thinks you should, uh, you should shut the hell up. That's not something you should be concerned about. And if you are concerned about it, you're a racist. Here's another uh, a gem from this uh, town gathering that Dayton attended. Our economy cannot expand based on white, B-plus Minnesota-born citizens. We don't have enough. Now, for anyone who's ever paid attention to politics in Europe, that sounds awfully familiar to what the Labour Party in the UK told its citizens. We need to import immigrants. We can't sustain our economy without them. And if you have a problem with that, you're a racist and we should shun you. Now, that turned out to be a complete fabrication. It was complete and utterly made up. It didn't help the economy. It created cultural tensions in the country. And here we see Dayton and the DFL employing that exact same tactic. Because it worked. It worked in Europe when that was used. And of course, Dayton doesn't oppose opening the uh, border in Minnesota, not just for people from Africa, but for people from Syria. Minnesota is one of the only states left that has an open border policy that wants Obama to bring in Syrian refugees. And again, don't you dare question it. The DFL will do your thinking for you. Now, one of the more interesting quotes from this particular article talking about this town hall meeting is the following. Another audience member took issue with the Minnesota chapter of the Council of American Islamic Relations accusing the organization of being supported by terrorists. CARE Minnesota Executive Director Jelani Hussein, who had previously addressed the crowd on its concerns on racial tension, said his organization is not affiliated with terrorist groups. As far as being called terrorists, the reality is that we are not a terrorist organization, Hussein said. We are a civil rights organization and we are proud to be called bad names when we are challenging people to do the right thing. CARE does great work on building relations between the American Muslim population and the general public. Now, CARE might sound familiar to you, because they've also been involved in Black Lives Matters. They started openly supporting it back in September. But that wouldn't be the only reason you might have heard of them. Following the San Bernardino terrorist attacks, where, again, multiple people were killed by Islamic extremists, much like the Paris terrorist attacks, CARE ran to the, uh, the aid of the families facilitating legal fees, doing press conferences, and generally getting involved. God, am I the only one who's starting to sense a pattern when it comes to the DFL party in Minnesota? Here we have politicians at every level who associate with groups that have made extremist statements or support extremist organizations. Black Lives Matter, Justice for Jamar, CARE. They all seem to have some kind of connection with these politicians. DFL party members, whether they're Minneapolis City Councilwomen or U.S. reps or the governor of the state, all seem to have some kind of an opinion on this. And that opinion is to be taken as law, because if you have a problem with it, as Mark Dayton himself said, get the fuck out of the state. We don't care 
if you're upset about immigration. We don't care if you have security concerns. You're going to accept it. Because if you don't, we're going to call you a racist. We're going to call you a bigot. We're going to abuse our office, much like Kano did, and release your private information in a hashtag used by people that have expressed sympathy for ISIS. And yet, this is the party that has the most political power in Minnesota. This is why we live in a blue state, because they can push this social agenda and use their office to make sure that their party politics and their personal biased beliefs are the ones that set the agenda moving forward. And it is ridiculous how it is you can have politicians openly say they support ISIS, associate with groups that support ISIS, that criticize citizens for having fears about immigration when we've had issues with ISIS in the state and people trying to go overseas to join them. To criticize them and tell them they're racist for even bringing up the issue is beyond me. But Minnesotans need to take a serious, fucking hard look at the party politics in this state. Because if you think these people represent your interests, you are wrong.